Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm Brother Adam, and I'm excited uh, that it's Sunday again and that we get to spend time in God's Word. Uh, of course, here at Bank Dock Baptist Church, we're so thankful for our Sunday School class. And we're so thankful that you guys are joining us and studying with us this morning. And I want to say to our folks, we miss you guys. We love you. We hope that you're having a great week, and we hope that you are enjoying our Bible study uh, through the book of Galatians. Today we're going to finish up Galatians chapter 3. So if you have your Bible or your phone uh, with your Bible app on there and you're following along, uh, go ahead and turn over there for us. We're really thankful. We've had a good week here at church and uh, had good services this morning. And so we're excited about all that God is doing. And uh, we're thankful uh, for all of you. We've prayed for all of you this week and we hope that you're having a wonderful week in the Lord. Galatians chapter 3 is so good. It's so good. I want to, uh, like we always do when we start off our classes, just kind of catch us up and help us understand what's going on in the story here in Galatians chapter 3. Okay, but Paul's letter now to the Galatian churches has moved through some heavy topics. Our first few weeks uh, in the study of Galatians, we have covered some heavy stuff and we've seen some tense moments between Paul and and these churches, and here's kind of what Paul has talked about so far, just so that we all have it fresh in our minds and hearts uh, before we study this last half of Galatians 3. But Paul has affirmed his apostleship, that is that he is sent by God to preach the gospel that he received from Jesus Christ. It's not another gospel, it's not a false gospel, it's the true gospel of Jesus Christ given to Paul, and Paul's gone out to preach that. And so he is now directly challenging the false gospel uh, that they have let creep into the church. And, and this issue that has come about has come about by false teachers. And Paul warns us that we're not uh, to have any kind of influence in our lives of false teachers. We should keep them separated from our lives. So he's talked about that. And uh, dealing with this false gospel that they had going on, uh, Paul has attacked it in a lot of different ways. Okay, the, What they had to summarize, and in short, what, what they had to said was that you needed to believe in Jesus Christ, but also you needed to follow the works of the law. And kind of intermingled those two things together and made this hybrid salvation. It's something we see a lot of churches in the New Testament actually struggle with this issue of these false teachers coming in. And so they had inserted themselves into this situation and they had talked about things and they had tripped up the church. And they had led them to believe that to complete the redemptive work in their life where they could stand just and righteous before God, they had to follow the works of the law mainly circumcision, but also all the other things that went along with that. Okay, so um, they're really making problems for these churches. And Paul's argued about this and shown them how silly it is. He had exposed the ridiculousness of this system by exposing, as we learned last week, that Abraham's relationship with God was not based on, on circumcision or on following the law. Abraham and God had a covenant 14 years before Abraham and his household were circumcised 430 years before the law arrived on the scene. And so Abraham's relationship with God, his belief in God, and his position of, of being righteous before God happened before all of these things that these guys are saying is necessary to have a right relationship with God. And so Paul has just absolutely obliterated this argument, but it's led us now to a really great question. And so Paul's going to tackle that today as he kind of turns the corner. He's gone from rebuking them and right out just, just exposing the ridiculousness of this false gospel they're following. And now he's going to kind of turn the corner. He's going to make the shift from rebuke of the church and the false gospel to where now he's kind of teaching them again. And he's building them up in understanding of what the true gospel is. Okay. He wants them to know, and this is important for us to remember uh, today. Paul wants them to understand that gospel is not a command to be righteous in front of God, but it's rather an offer from God to make man righteous before him. We don't do anything to stand righteous in front of God. All we have is just to receive the offer. If we receive God's offer of salvation, that's the message of the gospel, that we can do that and we can stand righteous in front of God. And so now at this point, when we start to get here in the bottom half of chapter three, it's helpful for us to kind of turn our mindset. And Paul is not like someone who is who is correcting the church and hammering away on the false things that are going on in their life. Now he's kind of being like a teacher and a helper and a guide and he's building them up. 
really the best illustration of this I could say is that he's parenting the Galatian churches. We've seen him correct their error. He's chastised them and rebuked them, punished them basically, right, for this error. And now that the issue is established, he's confronted it with truth, with truth. He's rebuked their sin and identified what led them wrong. So now he's building them up and he's helping them to mature in Christ. And uh, after they've fallen down, he's kind of dusting them off and setting them back on their path where they can go and they can bring God glory and they can spread the true gospel. And so Paul is saying all of these things to ensure that this fact is settled in their hearts and in their minds as well. So seeing that the law does not help us, following those works of law, do not help us stand righteous in front of God, right? If we do all these works and we have our faith mingled and those things don't make us righteous, then what is the relationship between the law and the gospel? That's the question Paul's going to tackle today. Just because they had messed up the role of the law doesn't mean that the law is a bad thing. Just because they had kind of made this hybrid system and stuff doesn't mean that the law is completely useless. So Paul wants to help them understand what is that role. And so today he's going to answer that question. But as we answer that question, and we will, by the time we get to the end, uh, I want us to follow four statements now concerning the law. Uh, as we get in here from Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 15 uh, down through verse 25. We'll just read them uh, kind of one by one as we go through these specific points. But the first statement concerning the law that I want you to see today is this. The law does not nullify God's promise. The law, when it came after God's promise to Abraham, it did not cancel it or change it or alter God's promise in any way. Look at verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. So he said, let me use an example here uh, of common man and how he would handle this situation. He said, though it be but a man's covenant, if man has covenant uh, between them or an agreement between two people or a law, if there's a covenant that says this is how we're going to operate and this is how our life's going to go. And this is the same rule and the same law that everyone's going to follow. And he says, if it's a man's covenant, Yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Can you imagine how crazy it would be if one man just walked into a police station or something and he said, hey, I'm here to change that law. I don't like it. So uh, we're done with it. It's over. He said, that would be crazy. Nobody would do that. Nobody gets rid of it. See, the churches in Galatia, they need to understand that when the law came, it didn't tamper or alter or change the promise God made with Abraham. So Paul gives in this comparison, a man doesn't change the law that he wants to. We don't just get to decide what's right. We have to follow the law. We have to follow the rules that have been put in place. A confirmed law in the Roman system was very hard to change. You can't just say it and then it happens. And so he says, if man's law is so unchanging and you can't just alter it with your opinions, why do you have a thought process where you think God's law can be tampered with or altered somehow? God's ways are obviously higher than ours. God's obviously stronger than any man. God obviously is more sincere and more true than any man. So why would you think that God would alter it if it's an accepted thing among you that no man just alters the law or promise or changes the way things is? Why do you think God would do that? He's making the point here. God's promises can't be changed. If God makes a covenant, he keeps it. That's why when God says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the scripture says that in Romans 10, 13. It's a covenant God will keep. If you call on God for salvation, he'll keep that. If you place your trust in him and you call on him to make that happen, it will happen. When God makes a covenant, he keeps it. We need to understand this. If there's problems in our life or there's things that we go through, and it's, it's a situation where we're like, how did we get here? What happened? It's not God's fault. Okay, God has not done something for your detriment. God has not done something uh, to bring you to like a destructive end. God, if you're a Christian, is building you up. He's helping you. He's keeping his promise. And sometimes he chastises us. That's still part of the promise. He's making that covenant of helping us, bringing us through sanctification, bringing us along. And so if we feel the pain, obviously, we got to understand we're the ones that broke the covenant in the first place. God keeps his side of the promise every single time. That's what we're getting to in this verse, okay? Look at verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, 
and to thy seed, which is Christ. Paul states here that the main purpose of the promise given to Abraham was not that many people would be a part of his family. That obviously is a part of it, right? God said, I'll make your descendants like the stars of the sky, the sand of the seas. We see, we see all these things uh, promised in scripture, okay? He says it's going to be so numerous that you can't even count them. But that's not the main part of the promise. He's saying that God would bless Abraham's seed. And he makes this statement here, but as of one. And then he points out who that seed is. Jesus Christ. He says that that seed is Jesus Christ. And through that one descendant of his, the Messiah, Jesus would bring by faith many into his heavenly family. One commentator said this about this verse. He said the promises made to Abraham were not only appropriated to one class of his descendant, that is to those by Isaac, but that they centered in one illustrious person through whom all the rest of mankind are made partakers. Through Jesus Christ, many would be blessed and God would bless the earth. So many people have become confused throughout time that God changes his mind from how he deals with people in the Old Testament, mainly like the people of Israel, and how he deals with people in the New Testament, that they're under grace. And so they say, well, it's law and it's grace. They say they're un they were under law in the Old Testament. Now they're under grace in the New Testament. So God have, must have been following one plan and then he veered off chorus and he did a completely different thing. He just changed his mind midstream and went another direction. That's not how it is. You hear this when I tell you this this morning, okay? God has always had one plan. There are different steps in his plan, just like there are different stops along a train line or a bus route. You stop many places as you get to the destination, but it goes where it goes. And that's God's plan. He's had it laid out exactly the route that he's going to take. And it's the way he intended. It brings us to the destination he wanted us to. We, the Old Testament saints went through law. Now in the New Testament, we're on to the section of grace as we get towards the kingdom, the eternal kingdom with Christ Jesus. God's destination has always been gathering us together in heaven. It's always been about redeeming fallen man. So we see that God keeps his covenant. And what was that covenant? That covenant that was was that through Abraham, a seed, the verse says, a seed, Jesus Christ, the Messiah would come and he would bless so many in the world and make a change in so many people's lives. And there's so many of us today uh, that can talk and, and uh, show testimony to that fact that God has changed us. Jesus Christ has made a difference in our life and his work is ongoing in us. And so... It's a true promise, and we're experiencing even that promise today in our lives. Let's look at verse 17. He says, In this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Paul reminds the Galatians again, the law came 430 years after this covenant between God and Abraham. So Abraham's not justified by the law. He was justified by his faith and belief in God. God counted him for righteousness. And so the law comes and the rules and the regulations about how to be right with God and the sacrifices they would have to make and the commandments they would need to follow. Uh, all these reminders that they needed and, and the things that they needed to do to keep them in this right position of following by faith. God in the Old Testament, knowing that one day that that faith would be completed and made whole in the work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary for us. Really what the law was in the Old Testament, it was like a credit card. I thought about grabbing a credit card out of my wallet this morning and holding it up for you guys to see and being like, this is what it was. It's a credit card system. But uh, undoubtedly, some of you would freeze this video and try to write down the number. So imagine a credit card. And it was like, hey, you can charge it now. It'll be paid for later. When they followed the works of the law in the Old Testament, that's how it was. They did the sacrifices. They kept the Sabbath. They followed all the things that they're supposed to do. And it wasn't that that paid for their sins eternally. No, it was that it was a holding it off in the plan as, as God's plan unfolded where the Messiah would come and he'd pay for once for all the sins of all mankind. And so the law had its place. It did not disannul the promises of God. It didn't change them or alter them. 
It was all in a flow as God's promises unfolded. We can't see God's plan every step of the way. I have, I have no clue what's going to happen tomorrow. I'll be honest with you. I have, I have no clue. I trust God. I trust that uh, what he has for me in my life is for my good. It's for my benefit. It's for his glory. But I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Neither do you. But as we look back, we can see God's plan unfolding in our lives. And we can see it also in scripture. As they came through the law, it's God's plan unfolding. Jesus Christ coming, it's God's plan unfolding. We see clearer and clearer and clearer every step of how God's plan has been at work uh, throughout the ages. And so God's plan of redemption has been unfolding and it is still ongoing. Let's look at verse 18. For the inher- for if, if, that's a big word. If you've got your Bible out right now and you're okay writing your Bible, I would circle that word if. Okay. For if the inheritance, this is uh, us coming into the family of God. This is us being uh, given a home in heaven and having a right relationship with God, being God's sons and daughters. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Paul's saying here, if, if you become part of God's family by your works, it's not something you were blessed with. It's not something that you were given. It's something that you earned. But he says, God gave it to Abraham from the beginning. That inheritance of being part of God's family was a gift from God imparted upon unworthy man. I want us to understand this. We cannot earn from God what God has already made up his mind to give us freely. You don't think about this. I love Christmas. If you love Christmas, maybe you'll appreciate this. You don't open a present on Christmas morning that you've earned. It is a gift that's freely given to you out of the love and care of someone else. Salvation is the same way. God's promises and our salvation is a free gift. We can't earn it. It's given to us. The law doesn't cancel out that promise of God. Let's remember that this morning. The law does not cancel out the promises of God. Second statement about the law. Second statement about the law that I want you to see here. Uh, Let's look uh, at verse 19 and 20, we're going to see that the law exposes our sin. Verse 19 and 20 says, Wherefore then serveth the law? What purpose does the law have? That's the question he's asking. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to who the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. So what purpose does the law have? If you aren't justified by it, you don't earn anything through it, and the law wasn't the promise of God, what role does it have in people's lives? What role does it have today for you and I? Paul says it was added because of transgressions. Verse 19, he says it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. And then it says through a mediator and God is one. Hopefully you're following along and you're paying close attention. And if you are, The statement I just made summarizing verse 19 and 20 is probably complex and not easily understood. Let let me read it for you one more time. The law was added because of our transgressions through a mediator and God is one. That's a summary of what Paul just said. You might be like, what are you talking about? Well, if you're a little confused or you're like, hey, I need you to break that down a little more. You're in good company. Uh, I heard one commentator this week say this. He said over 300 translations, opinions, and positions on this verse have been reached over the years uh, from Bible scholars and secular scholars as well. They have a lot of disagreement on this. And so uh, it's very helpful as Alistair Begg says when we read this to keep the plain things the main thing and to keep the main thing the plain thing. So you take it at face value, talk about the plain things that are in it and we'll get to where we need to go. Okay, so it's the key to understanding this verse. It's plain, it's simple. Just look at what it says, okay? First of all, what we know about this is the law exists to expose the existence and distance of sin. That statement, it was added because of transgressions. It has a purpose. 430 years after this covenant with Abraham, it has a purpose. Why was it added? People were starting to stray from God's plan. And it was meant to expose who people really are inside. It's meant to show us who we are ourselves. How many people have you talked to and they say, well, I'm a good person. If you've been a Christian any length of time, you talk to people, you try to witness to them, invite them to be a child of God and to get saved. And uh, 
And they'll say, oh, I'm going to heaven. I say, oh, really, why? Most common answer I've gotten, ever gotten, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Or maybe secondly, they'll say, well, I'm a religious person, and I kind of do all this stuff, and it's, it makes me good. They want to assure me of what kind of a quality, you know, individual they are. Maybe even some of you watching this morning, you'd say that. That'd be your answer. Well, I'm a good person. But when we measure ourselves up against God's law, it shows us that we are, at the core of who we are, helpless sinners, and we can't do anything right in front of God. We can't, we can't do anything to help our standing. We are sinful, nasty human beings. And if all of us are honest this morning, and, and you open up your heart and you look into it from an outside perspective, we come to the same conclusion. There is sin and evil and wickedness in my heart. And in my life. And the law exposes that. If God says, hey, this is my standard. This is who I want you to be. These are the rules you need to follow. These are the things you need to do. This is all the stuff that, that you would need to do to be perfect. None of us can measure up to that. None of us can be that person. If even today we come to the realization and we say, okay, I'm going to keep all those rules from now on. And let's just say you did. What about your past? It's all there. All those things are there and when we measure them up against the law we see that we fall real short of God's standard fall real short of what we ought to be but the law was added because these people were strained and it shows and exposes their sin we need to see ourselves as helpless sinners who need God's grace remember the law is like a mirror you look in it and the mirror cannot clean you up if you've got dirt and nastiness all over you the mirror can't clear you up. It just shows where you need help. It just shows where you need work. And that's what the law does. We look into the mirror and it shows us, oh, we're not right. We're not, we're not what we need to be. We need to change. It shows us our natural state and where we need to be made clean. Uh, a few weeks ago, our house flooded here in Thailand. We had a big rain. I know it was bad. It rained only like 20, 30 minutes. Our whole neighborhood flooded out, and uh, we were sitting in our house, and just real flash of water, real fast, just came flying into our house. Had about an inch of water in, in on the bottom floor, and so I'm up and trying to push water around and push it down drains and get rid of it, but the drains are full up now, so uh, everything's just floating around in the house, and so we're trying to keep water from coming in, and I'm picking up rugs and carpets and things and moving them. Uh, we have a two and a half year old little boy and so I'm trying to move him around and get him where he needs to be and I was running back down the steps and I fell and I came flying down the steps and as I came down the steps uh, if this is my foot I just saw my foot grab a handrail and this toe right here kind of separated and it went straight back like this and out to the side and I felt it crack oh oh it's a new level of pain Okay, I, I've been through a lot of pain in my life physically, but when you are flying down the steps that fast and you feel your little toe break and you stand up and your toe is like sideways, it is not a healthy feeling. It's pretty terrible. So I hobbled to the chair and sat down and my toe starts to kind of relax and, and we get a, a ice bag on it, wrap it up a little bit and I have friends on the way to help me out at the house and so they got there and they're kind of helping us move stuff around. And when we were done with that, uh, one of my buddies took me up to the hospital. And we're sitting there, and the doctor comes in, and, and he goes, okay, let's see where it hurts. And he starts poking around on my foot. And he says, does this hurt? No, not too bad. And he pokes up on top of my toe. Does this hurt? Oh, a little bit. But when he hit right where that break was in my toe, that translated me to a brand new dimension. I just want to tell you, it was all kinds of pain. He just stabbed, bam instantaneous terrible awful pain it didn't feel bad just when he touched my toe but when he pushed right on what the issue was right on that break it was very evident that things were not okay you know what the law does it prods around in our life and when it hits those nerves and it hits those problems that we have in our life bam we know exactly where the problem is so what's the law do? It puts its finger right on the issue of our sin and leaves us with no doubt who we are and how helpless we are. The law is what God uses as a go-between, between the sinner and salvation. It shows the problem, 
we're on this side, God's on this side. We can't measure up to it. The law convinces us we need God's help to make this thing right and to bring us to a conclusion where we have right relationship with God. And then when we hear the gospel, we accept the truth of the gospel, we trust Jesus Christ, it brings us to a right conclusion. There's a go between between us and between where we need to be. Thirdly, the law cannot impart spiritual life. There's no way the law can make you right in front of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 21. It is the law then against, or is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. He's kind of telling a story. Would the law make you righteous? No. If it could, then it would have been done this way. But it's not. Verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. Regardless of how good a person you are, regardless of, of how much sin you have in your life or how little sin you have in your life, doesn't matter all under sin. That's it. We shouldn't be trying anymore to sit back and say, oh, I can be good enough or oh, I can get where I need to be. No, if the Bible says that you're all under sin, it's how it is. We are all under sin. Watch this, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The law can't get us out of our trouble with sin, but God can. The law shows us we're drowning in sin, but the promise of Jesus Christ shows us that we have something we can grab a hold of. It shows us that we have a place to find help, that we have someone we can go to who can save us from drowning in our sin. There's a way out. There's grace to be had for those who believe in Jesus Christ. So many times uh, we'll talk to people and they'll say, oh, I just can't be helped. I, I, you know, if you just knew who I am or you knew uh, what I've done or what I've been through, you'd know God doesn't want me. It's not true. There's no sin so big that God can't overcome it and can't save you and forgive you of it. God is gracious. He'll save you. But nothing else can. He's our only option. That's who we need to go of. And when we, when we come to that realization... The next step is we need to realize where we can find spiritual life. You can find it in Jesus Christ. Our Bible tells us the one fundamental truth of all people who have ever lived, except Jesus Christ, is that we are bound in bondage to our sin and we're in danger of spending eternity in hell. That's the realization. That's the truth of who we are before Jesus Christ. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. We all start from the same place. We're all sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. And then we need to see that we can accept Jesus Christ and we can have salvation and we can live eternally with Him in heaven if we believe. The bottom of verse 22 says, to them that believe. Let's look at statement number four about the law. The law is like a prison and a tutor. Read verse 23 and 24 with me. But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed wherefore the law was made our schoolmaster to bring us unto christ that we might be justified by faith you know what the law did it trapped us we didn't have excuse we didn't have a way out and it just trapped us in you are in the jail cell of your sin and the law says hey this is where you're at it helps convince us of our need of outside help because we're trapped in the system of our sin it's like you're in a jail of sin. It locks us up so that we can see and, and know and experience the need to be set free. It's like a tutor that brought our knowledge to the point that we see the action that's needed. It's like it walks us along. Hey, this is where you're at. This is, this is what's going on in your life. This is what's happening. It shouldn't be this way. And it convinces us we need to look for help and we need to take action. It shows us that we must put our faith in Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 14 verse 3 says, they are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There's none that do with good. No, not one. We become convinced of that in our life through the function of the law. It shows us who we are and that we need Jesus Christ. Fifth thing I want to tell you this morning. We've gone through four statements about the law. This is the fifth thing. Faith brings radical change. Read uh, chapter 3. Verse uh, 25, and then we'll go on to verse 26. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. I think we're going to read the, the, a few more verses here in just a second, just because they're good. I can't stop at 25. We're going to keep going. 
Okay. The law is no good to us once we have faith in Christ Jesus. When you got saved, you became a child of God. Verse 26, you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You moved from an enemy of God to a family member of God. There was a huge radical change. You're fighting against God. You're part of God's family. When you hear that statement, family of God, it's not just a figure of speech. Uh, we hear that a lot in church. We say, well, you know, I'm part of God's family. Or someone say, oh, it's, I'm so glad we're all in God's family together. There's even songs about it, right? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. There's a song that goes that has a line in it like that. It's not just a figure of speech. It's your identity once you come to God by faith in Christ Jesus. You are a part of God's family. You literally have a heavenly home with a heavenly father that brought you into the family. And it's always been his desire to bring you in, even when you were an enemy or even today, if you don't know Jesus as your savior yet, and you're still an enemy of God, he wants to bring you into the family. It's always been his desire. I want to ask you today, are you part of God's family? Have you accepted Jesus Christ's gift of salvation by faith? Have you trusted him alone for salvation? If you haven't, you need to. If you have, isn't it an awesome part or an awesome thing to be a part of God's family? It's amazing. Uh, let's, let's read on. I, wanna, I told you I want to get to a few more verses here. Verse 27. For as many of you has, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We have been put into Jesus Christ, baptized into his family once we come to him by faith. Now don't confuse this. Baptism itself, as in the submersing somebody publicly in water after salvation, for a picture of what God did inside of them. That has its place. This is not that baptism here that we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual baptism first, what Paul is saying, being put into Jesus Christ. And it always precedes physical baptism, the picture of our salvation. So he says, when you're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. Verse 27, let's, let's read one more time. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now let's look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, but ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, this is something that's so great and so powerful about the gospel. The gospel crosses all cultural, ethnic, and generational lines. It's for everyone. There is nobody that's excluded from the offer of salvation. We're all equal in God's eyes, and we're all equal in God's family when it comes to salvation. God wants everyone to accept that gift of salvation and it's not limited by anything about you if you will open your heart and you'll receive christ it's good you don't have to wonder if he offers it to you or if you're included you are look at verse 29 and if you be christ then ye are abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise once we're in christ we discover who we are we discover our significance there are so many people in the world, oh man, you hear about it all the time, movies, uh, news, TV, music, uh, articles that you'll read online, even stuff that people talk about in schools or in social circles, cir cir social circles. There's so much of that that revolves around this idea of fulfillment and identity and significance and worth and value. Guess where you find it? You find it in Jesus Christ. And you have the promise of God. You're an heir. You're accepted. You're part of God's family when you have Jesus Christ. There's no reason for any Christian to get depressed, to feel alone, unwanted, or unimportant. You matter to God. And since Christians matter to God, we should always matter to one another. We don't fellowship together because we're in the same geographical location. We don't fellowship together because we speak the same language. We don't fellowship together because we're of the same socioeconomic level, right? We come from the same kind of uh, middle class or, or low class or high class, whatever. We don't fellowship together because of any of those factors. We fellowship together because we're part of God's family. We are a body in Christ and in the local church because we're God's family. And there's so many differences between us and there's so many different experiences between us of things that have happened in life. None of that limits us or puts us outside of being part of God's family. We gather together, we serve together, we love one another, and we serve one another because we are God's family. We're heirs according to that promise that God made to Abraham that one day from his seed, Jesus Christ would come forward and we would be blessed forever. So what's the conclusion? 
We talked about that question. What's the relationship between the law and gospel? It's this. The law teaches us of our need for Christ. It shows us that we need help. And in doing so, it opens our heart to the good news of the gospel once we understand the bad news of our sinful situation. The law teaches us and helps us see our need, and it prepares us for the good news of the gospel. Now, the believer lives in grace, is abundant and free. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ are part of a family that spans time, cultures, and ethnicity, and the family of God's a beautiful thing. Let me talk about let me talk about two action points with you real quick. Two things that I think all of us need to hear. Number one, if you're a Christian, this one's for you. Live free in Jesus. Live free in Jesus Christ. Don't be discouraged by your past or let it keep you from serving God in the present. The Bible says once we've been saved, we don't need the schoolmaster. We're not hemmed in. We're not locked down anymore. We're free from the law and we're a valued, loved part of the family of God. Everything about our past should only be used as a testimony of the change that God has made in our life. And so don't sit down and be like, well, I was this way before and I just don't know if I can, you know, do certain things or whatever. Serve God. If God gives you an open door to do it, do it. If God puts it on your heart that you want to serve or, or something, uh, that there's a way that you can help out, ask. Don't feel limited by your past place. Praise God that he's made a change in your life. And together with others, go on in service and do what you can for the Lord. Number two, if you don't know Jesus Christ yet as your Savior, maybe you're watching this and you're like, hey, I'm totally new to all this stuff. I want to encourage you today, become part of God's family. And we can talk with you about that and how you can pray and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can have freedom in Christ and not be under the law any longer. Not in bondage to sin, not jailed up, but you know Jesus and you're free in him. So that's today's lesson. Galatians 3, the law has a, a purpose. It's worked for us. It's helped us. And now we're free from it in Jesus Christ once we get saved. And it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful gift from God. God keeps his promises and his covenants, and we're seeing God's redemptive plan unfolding from all the way back from the promise made to Abraham through the law in the Old Testament, now to the New Testament, the death of Jesus Christ, the age of grace. God's plans unfolding, and it's an amazing thing to see. I hope you guys have an awesome week. We're praying for you. We love you all. God bless you, and we'll talk to you soon.